video edition of the Bob Thurman Podcast is brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community and listeners like you. To learn more how you can support this podcast, please visit bobthurman.com. Today, I haven't been with you for a while. Uh, My friend has been publishing podcasts from past teachings. And uh, now I'm talking to you live on the 11th of June, 2018. And on a nice afternoon after a lot of rainy days here in the Catskills. And um, surprisingly... I'm in a good mood, even though the world seems a little bit imbalanced, to say the least. And um, what I want to talk about today is His Holiness the Dalai Lama and his teachings and uh, how we can repay his kindness in a way. I want to talk to you today about the Dalai Lama's teaching for secular people. You know, Buddhism, in a way, I consider Buddhism to be secular personally because I was never too religious myself, although I was a Buddhist monk or mendicant. But that's just a way of getting a lifelong scholarship, really. It isn't necessarily a religious thing in a pious way in that you don't become a Buddhist mendicant, at least in the ancient time, Yes, in order to pray and in order to worship someone else. You become a mendicant to be a full-time student and cultivator and meditator and learner and scholar and yogi or yogini because you want to become a kind of higher aware being, a being of higher awareness, higher consciousness. The human consciousness is better than deep sleep, unconsciousness, and um, it's better than sort of involuntary consciousness like that in a normal dream, because it's an awake consciousness. But compared to a higher consciousness, a human consciousness is almost like a sleepwalking consciousness. And particularly the type of human consciousness that is educated not to look back into itself and to try to understand its own inner workings. The way we're brought up and the way we're educated, and I was highly educated, supposedly, although I I think of myself as quite (laughs) deficient in many areas, but nevertheless, I'm supposedly highly educated as regards our culture. And uh, we're never taught, really, to look inside ourselves, even if we are student of psychology or sociology. We sort of are looking into uh, our culture and um, when we might become mentally deranged and how to deal with that. We don't really look into normal consciousness to try to understand it. We're not taught to do that. Meditation, in my 50 years of teaching in colleges, uh, occasionally I have... um, expose students to trying to meditate a little bit, sometimes three minutes, five minutes. And then I I, created kind of a furor on some campuses of people saying, well, you were trying to get them to practice religion. And that was not the case. It was just a matter of looking at themselves. Just like in a science class, you would ask people to go out and inspect the wetland to see what the tadpoles are doing and which kind of like frogs are are doing what, and what kind of, uh, you know, uh, bacteria or microbes are there, you know, you would be looking at all of that just to investigate what's there. It's not religious. It's not being an environmentalist. It's not a religious commitment necessarily. It might be spiritual in a way by respecting the world and unto, with which we are all connected especially in a culture that sort of preaches the disconnection from that nature. So so we're never taught that anyway, that's what I'm saying. So the Dalai Lama, so the Buddha himself 
in ancient time, 2,500 years ago, he kind of rebelled against his normal human culture and consciousness at that acculturated consciousness at that time, which was again, you were given duties to do and you had learning to how to manipulate around and do those duties. He was taught to be a prince and a general and a warrior because he was of the ruling class. And, um, and then you were taught that about any deep kinds of inquiry, you turn to the priests who will take care of you in relation to mediating your aims with those of the gods through offerings and rituals and worship. And that then the gods would take care of you. So that was sort of the normal culture. And uh, like our normal culture, you know, we are taught to have a profession and be productive and maybe we could have a religious thing or we could have a sort of secular ideology and be anti-religious, either one. And um, we're not taught to try to understand our own consciousness as if that were a central thing. But Buddha said, Buddha and his followers, they, they made statements like, if you don't like walking barefoot, all day long because there are sharp things on the road. You have two choices, pave the road with suede leather, all the roads, the whole earth even, or make a pair of shoes so you can walk on the shoes. So in a way, the pair of shoes, the surface of our subjectivity that fits against the universe, all the universe of all the objects, is our consciousness. So is our consciousness like a protective? Do we know what it is? Do we know how to wield it? Do we, or actually are our inner impulses, thoughts and drives driving us around? Our addictions and afflictions and worries and anxieties, are they controlling us or are we controlling them? That's the question. And we're sort of told you should be in control of yourself. But we're not trained to do that. We're not educated to do that. And that's what His Holiness the Dalai Lama has been doing so nicely, kindly. He doesn't want people to be Buddhists, but he wants them to improve their lives by learning more about their mind. So he has a great book called Beyond Religion, which I like very much. And he, from which the first part is where he talks about compassion, and how our common humanity and the quest for happiness, we should not feel embarrassed that we want to be happy, that's normal and natural, and actually we should be happy. We are very fortunate beings. We're very intelligent, sensitive, we're very social, we can cooperate with others and intensify our abilities by cooperating with them. We are, um, we actually have a fairly decent embodiment a tremendous brain for understanding things and a great heart, a good heart for connecting with other beings in a positive way. So we have every reason to be happy just the fact that we are human and we have a good environment within which to be happy. And so, and he discusses that kind of thing and then what really makes us happy is being, expanding our field. Also, he doesn't make this point as strongly because it's sort of so taken for granted in, in the Buddhist culture. But <clears throat> the only Western philosopher who has addressed this that I know of is someone called Andy Clark. We are kind of field beings. You know, the broadest field is our visual field because we sort of see things far away. We can also hear things far away. Smelling things, we smell more or less close things, tasting and touching, we have to contact them. But that means that the things that we perceive or that are in our field of awareness, in a way, are us. Because we kind of design the field by the way we see, the way we've learned to see and hear and smell and taste and touch and think, actually. And we, so we are, um, we're kind of field beings, right? But we're not taught that kind of. So he doesn't emphasize that much. Because we're field beings, we very much link up to others and we kind of do feel the feelings of others, whether we sort of think we do or not. When they are happy, we feel happy. We may still feel miserable about some other thing, but you know, the fact that they're happy tends to ra radiate to us a kind of feeling of happiness. When they're really wretched and miserable, 
we feel wretched and miserable. I think this is one of the reasons why people who work in prisons as the guards tend to become very brutalized as they work there because they're, they're, they're f picking up on the suffering of the people imprisoned there. And of course, the people who are imprisoned there are usually, not always, there's a tremendous amount of injustice in any system, but usually they've also done something unpleasant to somebody else. So they sort of start out on a bad footing, then they're quite aggressive with each other, they can be, and then the people guarding them then can feel that vibe, and so they feel agitated and stressed out. So they tend to promote the, the unhappiness more by being violent and being behaving really like criminals even sometimes themselves, but legally, because they're the guards. And that's because we are all field beings. And so when we're immersed in a field of other beings, we share their feelings, whether we like it or not, and whether we know it or not. And therefore, when we have compassion for them or love for them, love meaning we are alert to whether they're happy. Love and compassion are the same really together. It means an alertness, an awareness of whether another is happy or unhappy. And when there's a possibility of their being happy and a wish for them to be happy, that's called love. And when, they're, when one feels they're unhappy and one feels that's unbearable because it's impinging on one's own awareness, really, practically speaking, not just because one is Mr. Nice or Miss Nice, but because one feels that unhappiness, that's called compassion. And so he makes a big fuss about that because the more you sort of live in awareness of the state of those you're with, the more you will try to improve that state, and then the more your state will improve. It's a surprising thing. People wrongly think if you're compassionate with others, you will get more messed up, and you'll be all trampled on, you'll feel bit worse, and you'll feel bad, and all this. They talk about compassion fatigue. Carl Sagan used to use an expression like that, but that's really quite wrong. Compassion energizes you, it doesn't fatigue you. Love energizes you. We know that love does, and compassion also does real compassion, sort of feeling, well, it's too bad they're like that, but I don't really care that much about it, and it's annoying to me that I have to be aware of it because I don't care about it. That sort of thing is not a true compassion, and that does give you fatigue, for sure. But what's fatiguing you is the effort to pull away from your natural awareness of others' suffering and your natural sense of it's being unbearable that they should suffer like that, which is what compassion is. So when you try to shut that off, that's a stress. That stresses you out, and that's where the fatigue comes from, not from the compassion. Maybe. I don't know. <clears throat> I'm open to counter-arguments. So anyway, he does that for the first part of the book, and then he has a second part, which he calls Educating the Heart Through Training the Mind, which I really like that. Often we think that mind training is just mind, and we don't realize that it has to do with the heart. And the goal of enlightenment is open-heartedness not just brilliant-mindedness, it's open-heartedness. And open-heartedness then wants brilliant-mindedness in order to be able to do things that are beneficial to the world and to others, because your heart is open to the world and to others. But the real source of your happiness and the real source of your ability even, and energy, is your own open heart. That's a very key thing. Enlightenment is often misunderstood to be just some sort of brilliance. You know, like, I'm so smart, out there, I'm enlightened. But that's not necessarily the case. If I'm so smart, but I'm mean to other people, I'm totally unenlightened. That's a proof. If I'm nice to other people, even if I'm a little dumb, I'm more enlightened. <laughs> I mean, we, I don't, if I really care about other people, I don't want to be dumb, because I want to know how to help them. So then I'm going to learn, and I'm going to be, get smarter, you know. Basically, right? So then he says, in the first half of this book, I offered an entirely secular basis on which to understand the importance of compassion on inner values. He made a big effort in that light because he did it on the basis of our biology and not on the basis of, of some Buddha said so or God said so or Jesus said so or Muhammad said so. It's not a religious commandment that he's giving at all. It's a practical thing based on our biology. But understanding the need for these qualities is not enough. We must also act on this understanding. 
So how are we to bring this understanding and translate it into our everyday lives? How are we to become more compassionate, more kind, more forgiving, and more discerning in our behavior? It is in response to such questions that, in the remaining chapters of this book, I offer some thoughts about ways in which we can begin to educate our hearts. That's so great. A nice idea. How to restrain our negative behavior, how to combat our destructive emotional tendencies, how to cultivate inner values such as compassion, patience, contentment, self-discipline, and generosity, and how to develop a calm and disciplined mind through mental training and cultivation. And um, the practices presented here require no religious belief or commitment. They constitute an approach to living ethically and in harmony with others, of course, with a deeper sense of well-being yourself, which can be practiced in a way that is independent of any specific religious or cultural perspective. That's really nice. You know, I could just read his thing. Educating the heart takes both time and sustained effort, though I have no doubt that with sincere motivation we can all learn kind-heartedness and we can all benefit from it. It's really nice. So, you know, recently I was very, very fortunate to meet a very nice person, another former Buddhist monk, like myself, named Andy, who happens to be one of the main guys on the, um, heart, Headspace, the computer meditation program, mindfulness program called Headspace that you get on your phone, where you can click onto it, open the app, and it will get you, give you kind of guidance and sort of set you a marker for you to spend a little time contemplating, being mindful, looking into your own awareness, uh, calming yourself, breathing and relaxing. Really cool, I think. I like it very, very much. Now I'm going to blow my nose. And my friend will cut that out of the thing. Okay, moment of silence after. <laughs> when I speak, why does my sinus start draining like that? It's so annoying, you know. Because it's drawing all the moisture to your tongue. It's keeping your what? Your tongue's trying to stay moist, so it's drawing all the moisture from your sinuses. Oh, I see. Okay. It's been medicine, bro. So, okay, starting again. So mindfulness sounds kind of fussy, and then maybe some people kind of don't like it from that, for that reason. But really, it's kind of what it is is being uh, is remembering what's going on. One of the reasons that we have such a narrow experience, and oh, listen to the wind chimes outside. I don't know if that's being picked up, but if it is, it's, it's pleasant. I could have a musician out there dinking a chime, it would be very good. Right? It's really the word mindfulness, smriti, or sati in Pali, it means remembrance. And, and one of the reasons that we have a narrow view of our day, and we sort of go through our day a little bit sleepwalking, you could say, is that we don't have our full attention on what we do. We are multi-tracking all the time. That is to say, we're doing something, we're watching where we walk, or we're typing, or we're, you know, whatever we're doing, doing some exercise, running. But our mind is thinking about other things. And the word remembering is one of the things that we are doing, of course, is remembering a lot of things that we experienced in the past. And there are emotions that go with it, either happy emotions, remembering something nice, resentful and annoyed emotions, remembering something not nice. And then when we're not doing that, or even simultaneously with doing that, we're anticipating, you know, if we're running or jogging, we're anticipating getting where we're getting. We're thinking about how many calories am I losing? We're thinking of, is our Fitbit watching what we're doing or our Apple Watch? You know, we're, we're all preoccupied with a lot of other things that splits our awareness. So it actually lessens 
our awareness of any one of those multiple tracks that our consciousness is just ruminating on. And then there's a lot of other stuff in our awareness, perceptual, you know, like peripheral perceptions of things. Like if we're running, you know, the things on the side of the road, and trees up above, the clouds in the sky, the texture of the road, uh, you know, what, you know, landscape that we're passing. We kind of we're focused on getting to the end of the road. We don't notice, you know. So what mind, what we call mindfulness, what people call mindfulness in the in the app and in the craze, has to do with retrieving that remembering aspect of our mind from the past, from looking into the past, and in a way forestalling or discounting, setting aside the anticipating part of the mind, and focusing fully on what actually is going on in each moment, remembering that we are in the moment. That's where we are. Even though we don't want to do it too sharply, because if we do, we realize it's, there is no moment. It's just past trundling into future. You know, it's like a line, moving line, but the line has no width, you know, so there is no place, the moment. If we look for it, if we don't, we feel we're here. Okay, when we just, uh, un, you know, just know that. And then bring, collapse the anticipation and bring the remembrance into mindfulness, into remembering now. And suddenly we notice a lot more things about what's going on. And we can also appreciate nature more if we're out, if we're looking outward. And if we're looking inward and we're in a peaceful, calm setting where we have a chance to do that, because we're not engaging with the out, outer thing, we're not driving, we're not, we're not you know, in the middle of a path or something we have to follow, then we can look inside and we can see, okay, I'm now looking inside, and what do I see there? And then people use things like um, just focusing on their breathing, just being aware of breathing, try to narrow even more in a way, which then immediately makes them feel, become aware of all the distracting, multitasking other channels in their mind. And here then the task, the mindful task, is to notice all those other channels. And then one becomes to see a very rich bunch of voices in one's own mind. And um, one should just do it to see what's there. You don't try to do anything to it right away or about it. You're just seeing it. And because you become more aware of it when you're focusing on breathing, you develop a method, habit, a, a regime of not following the other tracks of the remembrance, the memories, the anticipations, the general thoughts, the stream of inner monologue, some people will call it you know, inner voice or voices, and come back from them to just breathing. And it's not that, and then breathing itself is a very rich experience. Your body is so grateful about it. You're taking in air that has, is redolent with oxygen given to you by plants. And it, this goes into the lungs and the very delicate membranes, the alveoli and things in the lungs. And then it, the oxygen part can pass through into the bloodstream. And then this takes, it goes in the form of energy to the organs and your cells and your tissues, and your brain itself. It's an amazing process and it's so rich when you draw it in. You know, as you know, if you try to hold your breath for a while and how deeply deprived you feel after 60 seconds. So, you know, becoming really deeply aware of the whole breathing process. Actually, although it seems like a narrowing of your focus, it will actually increase your expanded awareness. Of course, at first in the sense of and noticing all the distractions about whatever you try to focus on. So that's this what is that's a lot of that's a, that's the beginning of the kind of mind training, and also seeing aspects of yourself that you may have repressed or you may be in denial about, because some of the thoughts you, after a while you'll find might be a little bit risque, they might be a little naughty, they might be negative in some respects. 
And uh, the point is that they don't just become that because you notice your breathing. It means that there are flows of thought in your mind that are not life enhancing. They're not enhancing to you. And you're just so, they're so used to them, you don't notice them. And then they bring you down and they make you feel dissatisfied in your daily life. So you, you, at first just becoming aware of that already changes that equation. Gives you more freedom to begin finally to choose among the different types of tracks that you have going in your being, in your mind. Your mind is so complicated. It's not simple. And you're not trying to make it simple either. You're trying to just see what it is. Okay? Some people think you're trying to lose your mind and that that's really simple and, that, and not having a mind is a simple state compared to the complexity of having one. But actually having a higher mind, a greater awareness might be more aware of the complexities of the world and its finer details in an appreciative and positive way. And so, in fact, it might be more complicated. An enlightened mind might be more complex rather than more simple. This is something we have to be open to, actually we can learn about. Because the great thing is, there are a great many Buddhist scientists, what we call the most important type of scientist, which is called inner science in ancient India, not just Buddhists, Hindus, also Jains, they all into inner science. And uh, that science is considered the king or, of the sciences in that it's the one that's most important. It, it, you could say it's psychology, but in a way, modern psychology, which looks at the mind as if it were just in a product of the brain, looking for some drugs or some chemicals or some, some, um, some things like that, that, that if they create consciousness, um, that's not really inner science. It's treating the mind itself as an outer entity, an external material entity. You know, race extensa, as Descartes would say. So, instead of race cogitans. So, um, so that's what he's, uh, His Holiness does himself. You know, he's a person who lives under tremendous stress. He's 83 uh, years old this year. Western way and Tibetan way, he's 84 because logically they consider you're a, almost a year old when you're born, because you've been living inside your mother's womb for 10 lunar months or nine solar months. And um, so you've been existing in there, even though you are not aware, of, you know, you're, you're, you're kept cozy and nourished, uh, although maybe not so comfortable some of the time, if mom gets in a bumpy road or you know, she has some indigestion or some problem. So you're very susceptible to what your mother feels, actually. But you've existed. So they, so he's 84 in the Tibetan way of counting. Born in 1935. And um, therefore conceived in 34. So, um, so I wanted to just introduce that. And then I... Greetings and salutations, podcast wallas. This is podcast producer Justin Stone Diaz, and I'd like to welcome you to this episode of the Bob Thurman Podcast. This two part podcast was originally recorded. June 11, 2018, at the home of Robert and Nina Thurman in Woodstock, New York. As we heard, the first part of this week's podcast is Bob taking some time to get caught up with us listeners. It also included some ways that all of us can help repay the kindness of His Holiness the Dalai Lama for all his years of service, kindness, and years of teaching around the globe. If you're inspired by what you hear here, please be sure to visit the Dalai Lama's official website at DalaiLama.com. 
second half of this week's podcast is dear to us, and it comes with a trigger warning. In the past year, we've lost several friends to the Bob Thurman podcast in Tibet House U.S., and so the second half of this podcast is dedicated to them. If you're listening, Bakora, Lorena, or Anthony Bourdain, this episode's for you. And if you know if someone's struggling, or if you're struggling with suicidal ideation, know there's help out there. There's a National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255. We can all help prevent suicide. The Lifeline provides 24-7 free and confidential support for people in distress, prevention, and crisis resources for you or your loved ones. That number again is 1-800-273-8255. Special thanks this week goes to Omega Institute. More simply than a place, Omega is a global community that awakens the best in the human spirit and cultivates the extraordinary potential that exists in all of us. To learn more about Omega Institute, visit them in person in Rhinebeck, New York, or visit them online at eomega.org. This free weekly podcast is brought to you in part with the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community and listeners like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, including invitations to special Dossett tours with Robert Thurman and friends with geographic expeditions, please visit tibethouse.us. Tours in 2018 include Bhutan. Music for the Bob Thurman podcast is provided weekly by Tenzin Chogel. Used with the artist's permission, all rights reserved. To learn more, visit his website at tenzinshogel.com. And now, back to Bob in the second half of this week's podcast. introduced that and then I have a few things that are sort of current at the moment one is the President Trump is visiting in, uh, in Singapore with the North Korean dictator Kim Jong-un and I think we should hope uh, that something good comes of it even though logically speaking we we don't really think it will But, you know, even though we would think that America and the world, and even Mr. Trump himself, would be far better if he were not the president, which he's not really well suited to being. But maybe, you know, anyway, we should, since he is occupying that office, we should hope that even accidentally he stumbles into, and and even by the quirkiness of his unsuitability, He's doing something that someone wouldn't normally do, talk to a mass murdering, totalitarian, vicious dictator, cute as he might look with his own weird hairdo, a little bit obese, but still cute, but vicious, you know, from what he's done in life and what he's doing to his own people, which is the problem, of course, because he wants the nuclear weapons because they reflect his own paranoia and fear of other people, which he has because he's vicious to them. So when you you naturally assume by however you behave that others will at least want to behave the same way, you don't assume that they actually want to be nice if you tend to be very vicious and very violent and very callous, let's say, and self-centered, you know. You naturally assume that others are like that. So then naturally you want to arm yourself very strongly and you're afraid if you give that up that people will devour you. 
And it might be likely if he didn't have a police state that many people who are semi-starving or who, whose relatives are in prison camps or themselves have are, are been a long time in prison camps, etc., uh, they might want to be rather harsh on him if they had the opportunity, you know. Normal human reaction. You know? So how can he, you know, make a, become peaceful as a person? But he's afraid of his own people. That's the problem, you see. And how can you make him less afraid of his own people? If you say, well, you could be less afraid of your own people if you were nice to them, then he would think you were going to do regime change. And he said, you know, but on the other hand, this is what well, this would be one of the things. This connects to a fantasy I've always had where I wanted to have an island, like a paradise island where dictators could be encouraged to migrate when things were getting too stressful and their oppression level was too high and potential explosive resistance was too great. To invite them to go there, and I, I, you know, when Reagan invited the Marcos couple, Fernand and Imelda Marcos, to move to Hawaii and got them a nice house, and of course they were quite wealthy, they'd robbed a lot of money from the Philippine people, but, you know, and they could take some of it with them and even sent a plane for her shoe collection and so on. That was great because then they didn't stay to the bitter end killing off people who were protesting against them. So my fantasy is that we would have a facility like that where we could relieve dictators whenever they reach the point where it's too much and then sort of let things shake out in the country, you know, without killing them, without their own people just rebelling against them and wanting to kill them, you know. So that they don't get into that thing like the cornered badger, you know, or the cornered bear who is so much more dangerous when they feel cornered, you know. So who knows, you know. You know, invite, uh, invite him to take over the Trump Hotel in, on some island somewhere and maintain... Uh, telecommunication uh, with his people and um, w take credit for letting them rationalize and more, you know, relax their culture. You know, maybe avoid having another military dictator arise in his place based on the same mechanism, maybe, or lessen it anyway. Who knows? I mean, never mind. I don't want to go into it. I'm just saying let's hope that something good incidentally can come out of it. Maybe Kim Jong-un will think that Trump, well, the problem there, Trump is having more fun than him, even though he's frustrated that he's not a dictator because he lives in, a, in a, some kind of slightly decayed democracy. So it's more fun to be in one. So maybe Kim Jong-un will get, the, get that clue and try to figure out if there's ways he can gradually, gradually soften his rule without getting killed, you know. Loose the reins, loosen it, bit by bit. Just, and maybe we could develop a method of trying to help. Where we don't demand instant rechains and chaotic, like look, like the violent stuff like it happened in Libya and Iraq, creating more stress and something, you know, than removing a dictator by violence is simply no good. We should, we should complete 100% forswear such a thing that we just won't do that, ever. Which doesn't mean we'll abandon the people under the bad dictators. We will be we there and we'll develop programs and we'll encourage the dictators to come out of their caves, out of their shells, you know. A really new, realistic approach to world problems, I think, is what we need. And maybe this complete craziness of this gentleman representing us now or considering that he represents us. I think a lot of us he doesn't really represent, I'm afraid. But maybe the craziness, therefore, could be of some benefit. Let's pray that, in spite of himself, he does something for others, in this case. Let's hope. And um, same about Kim Jong-un. Maybe he can change. You know. But that's one thing I wanted to talk about today. And another thing is I wanted to express my condolences to the family and friends and um, all of us fa and fans 
of Anthony Bourdieu. I hope I pronounced that correct, or Bourdin, or Bourdieu, I'm sorry, who was very inspiring in his, uh, his um, travel and food things and seemed like he was enjoying life a lot and was very, very down to earth and, and uh, cheering other people up in this sad and untimely demise of his. And, um, but, which is a very unfortunate way to go. But I just want to say that let no one really think that it makes sense that, you know, some, some religious people, Western and Eastern both, kind of threaten people who commit harakiri in some way, who off themselves. They kind of threaten them that if you do that, you're going to have a horrible future life, I either will go to hell, I think some of the churches say, or become born in a lower form, some of the, some Buddhists might say, or Hindus. And um, I think that's a kind of silly, but it's natural that they would want to make people feel very worried and frightened to kill themselves because many things happen to make you feel like you would just like to get out of here and they want them to be afraid to do that because their life is so precious. So although maybe they're being silly to insist on just this, just this has happened, just that has to happen, um, they, um, it's understandable. Their motivation is to protect people's lives. And however, the basic rule in Buddhist biology, multi-life biology, Buddhism has, Buddhist science, not religion necessarily, but Buddhist science has a multi-life biology. And in that biology, what determines the quality of your rebirth, your ongoing continuum of consciousness that then finds another body usually, or actually always, even Buddha, but Buddha can find many at one time, that's the difference, and it's all voluntary. But anyway, you find another body, and what will determine the quality of that body and the quality of your next life is really how you lived your whole life. It isn't just how you passed away, the instantaneous thing, you know, the, the few moments or hours or day or two of how you die. Um, you know, in Buddhist cultures, they do pray not to die violently in a battle or war or state of anguish or something because it's not good to go into the to transition that way. But what really asserts itself right away once you're once you're separate from your body, your subtle mind continuum, your super subtle mind continuum, your soul continuum, you can say, Buddhist science would allow that saying certainly. Um, it will revert to its basic openness or closedness as an entity, and Anthony was clearly very open-hearted, very very kind. He was a chef, you know, a master cook. And, and nobody becomes that who isn't like interested in having others have the pleasure of eating good food. You know, they may have some ego there, but they, they like to feed others. They enjoy that. It's a nurturing kind of thing. So he surely will, in next life, he'll have an even better travel and cooking program. There's no doubt. And people should cheer up and he should cheer up if he's zooming around the planet listening to mentions of his name, you know, following Google, <laughs> Google search program, who thinks of him and who mentions him. And I'm thinking of him, and I'd like us all to think of him in a happy and positive way. You know, yes, we're sad you left, but use no reason for you to mope around because it's happened and it can't be undone. But what can be undone is any kind of heading in a bad direction and head for the great, you know, chef's kitchen in the sky. And, you know, how you express your love for people, that you express so much and so richly in your many wonderful and successful programs. And you, we know that you will carry with you the seed of that program in your soul, and you will find an embodiment and maybe a different planet, who knows, you know, a different country, perhaps you will not be French. You know, Paris the thought. <laughs> Since you have Emmanuel Macron now, the nice young future oriented pleasant person uh, leading your country. So Paris the thought, but you never know what you're gonna be, you know. 
And uh, wherever your heart draws you is where you will be. And it will draw you to wonderful new programs. So here's to you. And here's to you finding your way and being of good cheer as a traveler on the subtle Bardo plane, okay? And let those who mourn you sincerely do so and don't feel that if they are of good cheer to send you a positive, uplifting, uh, encouraging thing, like you wave goodbye to a traveler or you're missing that they're going, but you say, have a great time. So you're happy for them, hoping they will and wishing them to. That's how we should mourn people. You know, Irish wakes kind of have the right idea. You know, okay. So that's the other thing I wanted to talk about. And uh, I think that's all today. Um, I'm looking forward in future podcasts to beginning a process of Zoom and having interview people, other people, because I'm sure you're sick and tired of hearing me talk by now, is it's a, we're in our hundred and whatever it is podcast. And I would like to begin to collect an archive. You know, I've been on other people's podcasts and enjoyed them very much being interviewed by them. And I'm going to start doing that. So let's look forward to that together. Anyone who's seeing this, who's uh, who would like to be interviewed, send an email, tbt7 at Columbia Edu, and uh, or to bobthurman.com via bobthurman.com, and um, the conversation will continue. All the best, Omani pe mehum, and especially Omani pe mehum, may the Lord of Compassion, the thousand arm, thousand eyed, brilliant Avalokiteshvara, and the many many miracle-working Tara Devis, Tara Goddesses, may they guide him on the way with great care and, and skill and help him find a, a suitable new venue for his manifesting his loving nature toward humanity, toward others and toward himself, more toward himself in the next time. Okay? All the best. Okay? Okay, my dear friend and assistant has uh, requested me to do a short promo piece, which I'm notoriously bad at doing. And so I have two requests, actually. The first one, which is most timely, is that I am presenting in the vein of the Dalai Lama's teachings and how he has used them himself at Omega, on the weekend of the end of the month now, 29, 30, 31, something like that, the Friday through Sunday. And there's only a few people. I don't know whether it's because they're bored with Dalai Lama or bored, I think more bored with me. But anyway, maybe also they don't know that much about it because I'm not that good at promoting myself. So I want to encourage people to join me in Rhinebeck, New York at Omega. Uh, next week, next uh, two weeks from now, I'm going to Europe to meet His Holiness the Dalai Lama in this coming weekend, but the weekend after that, they can find me at Omega and I'd be delighted to see any of you who are there and um, who have the time and the, the resources to be there. And um, second, um, uh, I would like to request you who may be far away and can't do that to subscribe to this podcast at bobthurman.com and to tell your friends, and I, because I'd like to be able to reach more people. I think we have quite a few people. I don't really know. Um, maybe it's always the same few thousand who seem to get on my podcast. I don't know. But you've done it a lot of times. So there's been an overall aggregate is a lot of people. But I'd like to reach more people. Why? Not, I don't want you to be Buddhist. I don't want you to pay money. To me, I mean, I need to raise money for my nonprofit to save Tibetan culture, Tibet House and Menla. But I don't need myself. I'm okay. I have a pension, although I'm retiring. And, um, but I do want more people to cheer up and more people to find their bliss, as Joseph Campbell famously said. The reason being that, and here I do have a political motive at the moment, the reason being, when you find your bliss, you realize how powerful you are and how your thoughts, your words, and your acts, such as voting, 
have a huge impact on the world, and therefore you have a big responsibility. And you, but the forces of negativity want to convince you that what you do is meaningless and useless. So don't bother to do it. And that's why actually we're our democracy is in a bad condition now. And our democracy being in a bad condition, it means that a certain light in the minds of others who are aspiring under even more difficult circumstances than ours around the world do not have some sort of a maybe a little bit unrealistic, but still some kind of ideal to strive toward. So it, it impacts way out beyond our country, the fact that our country is messed up right now. So please, please, please cheer up. Because when you're cheery, and I'm not telling you who to vote for, and I'm not telling you what to do, you figure it out yourself. And when you're not angry, and when you're not hating anybody, and when you're not afraid of anybody, but you feel really great, you will make the best possible choice, I'm confident. Because you are a brilliant and, and powerful human individual. Okay? So all the best. Come to Omega, if possible. And subscribe to the podcast and recruit more subscribers. Okay, all the best. Study Buddhism up close and personal with Robert Thurman and the Tibet House U.S. membership community during GeoX trips to Bhutan and Mongolia in 2018. To learn more about these Dosset trips, with Bob Thurman and friends, please visit bobthurman.com. Thanks for watching.